You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Pamela Crane on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called Little Deadly Secrets, and this is a must-have for your summer reading. Let me tell you guys, this is this is a fantastic book. Uh, welcome to the show, Pamela. Oh, thank you so much, Hank. I'm excited to be here. Pamela, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? So um, I was eight years old when I actually learned how therapeutic writing could be. I, I have a little sister, and she would always steal my clothes, and I remember having this favorite pair of pants, and she scribbled all over them. So I had this journal and I started writing down all my childhood angst in this journal. And (laughs) um, that was probably my first step toward writerhood. And then a couple years later, when I was 10, after all my practicing of writing in my journal, my stepdad encouraged me to enter a local literary contest. And I wrote a short story about my grandfather and I won $200. So for me, that was like a year supply worth of candy. And (laughs) I was super excited. Um, And that's when I realized I could make money writing. Now, little did I know back then that it wouldn't be enough to even cover a water bill, but uh, I I enjoyed it. I got hooked at that point, and I started writing little um, stories about animals and inspired by Richard Adams' Watership Down. I tried writing my own little stuff then. So I was very young when I got addicted to wordsmithing. What what was it that you wrote that, that won that contest? Um, It was a story. My grandfather had passed away. So I wrote a story about my relationship with him. And um, it wasn't very long, but it was, I guess, pretty touching. So they 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 decided it was worth two hundred dollars. So I was pretty excited. Um, Nothing fancy. It's just an emotional thing for a 10 year old to write. So that's that's amazing. Um, you know, it it's so funny that uh, when people look back on these first experiences, um, you, you know, writing can be such a solitary and a lot of times uh, discouraging, disheartening experience. Um, you know, when you when you pour yourself out on the page and then you know maybe it it never sees the light of day, maybe it does get published and then you know people skewer you. All all of these emotions are wrapped up. Uh, in storytelling and it, it's fun to kind of remember some of those first experiences and and remember why you fell in love with writing in the first place um did did you ever have any of those experiences when you were you know uh, attempting to launch your career and and get it off the ground where it just felt like it was never going to happen oh yes it, it was it's actually <laughs> a curse to be a writer sometimes because we're an emotional group you know we oh yeah we, we feel so much and we put that all on paper and our, we sometimes get these big dreams and when they don't happen, as was my first foray into publishing, um, you know, it was actually quite heartbreaking because I, I wish I could say that my publishing journey was one from rag to riches, but it was more like from rags to moderate, pl- moderately priced clothing. <laughs> so um, I like, I remember when my first book, um, I had written it kind of as a therapy after a traumatic experience and I um, sought out an agent and I, and you know, I spent a year trying to get somebody to pick it up and this agent picked it up and then no, not more than like a couple months into my deal with her, she ended up deciding to quit. So then I found a small publishing house to pick it up, a small trade house. And they went out of business six months after my book release. So it was just like, 
like slam after slam to my ego as a writer. And I don't know, I guess I writers are a little bit egotistical. <laughs> we think everybody wants to hear our words. So when somebody just, when things don't align, we can just, it can be crushing. But um, that's when I decided to indie publish. And then um, with a lot of work and a lot of learning, I was able to, with an indie title, hit the USA Today bestsellers list. But it was not an easy journey. I mean, it was very long, arduous, ex educational experience. But it gave me something worth way more than a million dollars, which is character. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> It's so easy to say on the other from... side of it. What's that? I said that's easy to say on the other side of it. Right, right. I'm still looking for that million dollar check, but it, it, I learned how to have confidence in myself and not not put too much emphasis on what um, on my journey, but just kind of just keep going with it until I, you know, now I'm I, I'm where I want to be. But it, it was a very hard and uh, ego crushing uh, experience. <laughs> so what year was it that uh, that you first indie published? Um, who that was that my, I think it was 2006, okay. right when Amazon was really starting to grow. Um, and I was it 2000. No, no, might've been. Yeah, it was somewhere between, <laughs> sorry, my year, ever since I had children, I have no concept of time anymore. And <laughs> Girl, the coronavirus <laughs> has made it worse. Now I, I have no concept of days. So <laughs> I, I think a lot of people can uh, can relate to you there. Yeah, so I think it was around 2006 time frame that I indie published, but then I ended up switching. Um, they got picked up again b by another small house. Um, so then they got republished again in 2018. So it's I'm sorry, it's like such a such a strange journey. I pretty much encompass every possible author journey there is. <laughs> So 2006 was just prior to what we think of as the Kindle revolution and, yes. um, you know, when, uh, uh, when eBooks really became a force, uh, you know, to reckon with, um, what, what was it like to indie publish then uh, kind of before, um, it, it was, it, it's as easy as it is now. There wasn't as much information online. So I was just constantly digging for, like articles and stuff, how to, cause back then it was that people were the free books versus the like free and paid, you know, Kindle yeah. uh, categories were kind of blended, I think back then. And there was a lot of tactics on how to, well, you could cheat the system easier um, back then, but it was still, I, on, I remember telling my family, oh, these, these eBooks, they're not going to last. <laughs> they're like a one hit <laughs> wonder. There'll be a, a few people will buy them and then they'll go out of style. And now I myself have a, a e reader and I kind of laugh at my very uh, narrow mind back then. But um, yeah, it was, it was harder though. The market wasn't as saturated, which was great, but there wasn't as much, there weren't, weren't as many resources for authors. So it was kind of, it was tough. It was a little bit tough, but it was also exciting because for once indie authors had a shot at selling books and um, I did pretty good. It wasn't awesome, but it was encouraging, better than my, that small trade publisher was. So it was, it was kind of exciting to be learning so much. It just, everything moved so quickly. It was hard to keep up with everything. So what was the the first story that, that you wrote and published and Kind of what what vein were you in then? Um, so I my first I'll call it my big dabble into writing was um, a book I wrote as a form of therapy. So I had just gone through this crazy experience of being stalked and threatened by someone I knew. I mean, oh, it was no. very like th this guy was like had a one bedroom apartment with when the cops went to his house, they found a, a mattress with a wall of pictures of me on it, of, of candid shots of me. So it was pretty, <laughs> he was pretty That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. And so after a very long ordeal involving the cops and I had to relocate, I, um, I, I kind of needed something to help me process the trauma. So that turned out to be writing. And it was my very first book, um, which is called the admire secret. And, um, it, it kind of helped me get through all of the drama. And 
after that, I just, I was hooked. I was like, oh, I got to keep writing because I, I moved forward in, you know, psychologically. I was like, okay, you know, I feel like I'm healed as well as you can be healed from something like that. Yeah. But then after that, I picked the absolute worst possible time to start like really writing, which was after I had kids. So there I was a mom with four kids, ages five and under, and I have a horse rescue and I had an editing company and I'm, I'm like sneaking off. We have this 1970s RV that would make Cousin Eddie from National Lampoon's Christmas <laughs> Vacation Crowd. Like this thing is old as dirt. But I would sneak in there and do my writing. And then um, then that kind of segued into more of my domestic thrillers that I write now because I was writing crime thrillers back then. But then something about motherhood, it was probably you know, the insanity and chaos of having twice as many kids as parents, it inspired me to escape more into my writing and write more mother focused, women focused books. So it kind of my publishing or my writing journey started as therapy and now it still is therapy. <laughs> Want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level? Give Pro Writing Aid a try. Pro Writing Aid is a grammar checker, style editor and writing mentor in one package. Pro Writing Aid will never replace a human editor. Rather, it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor, they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect, but still feel awkward and clumsy. Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over-dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over-complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error-free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of Pro Writing Aid Premium. Pro Writing Aid, check it out today. What do you think it was about, about thrillers and, you know, originally you were more crime thriller than you uh, are more kind of character-focused thriller now? Um, but what, what was it about this genre that appealed to you? And And do you remember the first thriller that you read? that that kind of transported you to another place or or let you know that books like this could could do something to you stephen james was my first real foray into thrillers i absolutely loved his work um and after that i just started devouring it because i used to be a nicholas sparks reader i was romance and feel good stuff but um i don't know when i when i picked up Stephen James, I just felt like it was exciting, like it was something different. I, I, I uh, just fell in love with the mystery and the intrigue and the like page turning experience. Um, and that's when I wanted to write it. And that's especially because my own life experience had had that thriller element where I felt like on edge and what's going to happen. And I was constantly paranoid. Um, it, I was like, oh, I now it's kind of a rush. Like it now, I wouldn't recommend finding a stalker to to uh, traumatize you. <laughs> but <laughs> I did really enjoy the rush of reading something that just kept me wanting to know who killed who, or you know, how did this person die? Or um, my children make you know, kind of call me. They call me the mental mommy because. They're like, our mom writes about murder and being mental. <laughs> I was like, yeah, guys, I hope you guys don't need therapy <laughs> for being my <laughs> children. But uh, they, it, it even like, even my daughter enjoys writing and she's only, um, she just turned 10, but she's written three little short story murder mysteries too. So I guess maybe there's just something in our gene pool that really likes that, um, that sense of like almost horror and fear that pumps your adrenaline. Well, one thing that I've noticed that's that's interesting to me is that um, thrillers, especially like murder mysteries and things like that, um, they can really be therapeutic. And I know we talk about things like, well, I wrote a book as kind of therapy for me, or you've heard people say, you know, reading this book was 
was like therapy for me. There's something about riding right to the edge with someone, but not quite going over the edge, but but being able to to witness that, experience it from the safety of your reading chair or your bed or, or what what do you think it is about these kind of books that that we love so much and and why they seem to to be therapeutic for us? Um, I think the everyday person's life can be a little bit monotonous and dull. Um, you know, I, especially when each day kind of blends into the next and something about thrillers lets you live outside of your reality into something very real, um, but not real. Like, yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Cause it feels like that for me when I'm reading a book, I can read, I can read about something incredibly exciting and adventurous and not actually have to do it myself or and also the mind simulation from trying to figure it out i'm a big puzzle lover like i love figuring things out and trying to guess who done it um, i also was a big fan of sherlock holmes um, just even the procedural elements of trying to deep trying to figure out who did it so i guess it's like the mental challenge as well as the um, like you're stimulating not only your mind, but you're also getting your heart racing. So it almost feels like exercise without having to exercise. <laughs> <laughs> if only we that. could lose weight from reading, that would be, that's the, okay. that's what we, someone needs to figure that out. <laughs> right, right. So what was the first book that you wrote and, and published where, that you felt like um, there, there was kind of a, a groundswell that, that, uh, okay, I'm connecting with people and, and people are, are buying my book and, and I'm kind of coming into my own as a writer. For me, the first book that I really felt excited about writing and pushing out and got wonderful reception was it's called Pretty Ugly Lies. And it's a story about four women and their lives intersect in a very unusual way. And I, I liked, I started it with the murder of, somebody but we don't know who and the story is the story attempts to give you four different potential suspects but their moms their wives their friends so they're neither, none of them really seems like they could be capable of something like that because we connect with them but then you know what will push someone to their extreme that was the that was basically the theme of the book is you have an, all these everyday women because I, I was reading in the news numerous times. You can see this in the news of women like driving off a cliff with their kids or, you know, murdering their husband in his sleep. And um, so I was like, what would cause somebody like everyone's like, oh, I didn't expect that from her. She seemed like such a nice lady. She had it all together. And then suddenly she's doing something insane. And I was like, what could make somebody do that? And that's kind of where that book took off in it. It, um, it did really well and I was just super excited about it. So that was probably, and that's when I fell in love with domestic thrillers. I was like, oh, this is my genre. This is what I want to write because I understand these moms. I understand these women and I want to get to know, I want to pick inside their brains and find out what can make a normal person go crazy or do something heinous. Um, because it's just the whole psychological question of that was always intriguing to me. So, um, but a lot of women loved them. I mean, they're like, wow, these ladies are nutty, but, <laughs> but they're relatable. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, maybe we're all a little nutty. <laughs> what are the boundaries of the genre to you? Um, when you're writing a domestic thriller, what, what separates that from crime fiction or, you know, any other genre? What, what are some of the, what, what are some of the boundaries that you work within? The boundaries would probably be um, if they don't include as much of the procedural aspect of trying to figure out who was killed or, and who did the killing. Rather, it's more about the characters themselves and the emotional progression of these characters from a place of normalcy to the brink of breaking. So a, a lot of the journey isn't so much action, 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 but it's more like little things chipping away and picking at their, the facade that these women put on and until they crack. 
And a lot of it can be like just everyday drama we relate to, um, you know, marital, marital fighting, infidelity, ch children driving us crazy, friendships, like friendship traumas. Um, where, you know, backbiting and things like that and betrayal. So a lot of the themes are more are more relatable and everyday themes that all compounded can really destroy somebody or destroy a family. So I think that's what that my boundaries are more like within the family element of what what these families look like and how your neighbor next door could be one of these characters. Like in, in so it's kind of that's what I like about it is that it's so relatable. Um, so then whenever you're reading it, you kind of feel like, whoa, this could be my next door neighbor. I thought she was a pretty nice lady, but oh, she's showing some red flags. Or <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love this genre is uh, because it makes me feel better about giving my neighbors a side eye a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta watch out for them especially but, those suburban nights <laughs> i know it's it can be so crazy so your new book is little deadly secrets um pamela what was i, I love to to hear about uh where stories begin and and i know the question is trite you know where do your ideas come from and um you know, ideas are all around us, uh, but there's something about that special idea that kind of floats above the others. Um, when you're when you're thinking about a new story, what comes first? Is it a character? Is it a setting? Is it a, a newspaper article? Not, not that news, newspapers exist anymore. Um, that <laughs> that you you know a, a news article that maybe you've read or seen that that kind of starts the uh, you know the what if scenario. Where where, where do they begin for you? Well, I never use Facebook news. <laughs> we all know how unreliable that is. Um, but actually, like for Little Deadly Secrets, it all started with a photograph I found of me and two of my girlfriends in college. And we were doing these Charlie Angels poses. Um, I, remember I had these like big black leather like goth boots and we were a trio of best friends. And that is what started Little Deadly Secrets. I came across this photo last year and I was like, oh, I remember all the good times. And we got into our own little, you know, young adult or teen drama. I mean, we were in college age, nothing terrible. We didn't break any laws that we're aware of. Maybe a couple small laws, but nothing bad. But um, it inspired me about the bonds, the, um, the bonds between friends, especially three best friends. And we're still friends even today. And I, it took my, that kind of kindled the idea of, well, what would ever break us apart? Because we've been friends for so long, I couldn't imagine anything tearing apart our friendship. And so I always start a story with a question. And sometimes it will be in, like the actual murder will be influenced by actual cases that have happened because I, I want them to be believable murders. And, you know, truth is our greatest drama you know when you look at the news and how you're like what the heck how, that, that's stranger than fiction um so i do use a lot of real live instances to to carry out the murders but they're usually the friendships or something even little i'll just come across some some a thought or a memory and that kind of will push the storyline along and be like the center of my story and then i build out from there Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox, it allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline 
and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. So this idea of friendship and what uh, kind of what friendship means and how far will you go for your friends, um, how did that start evolving? Did and that when did the the characters of Mackenzie, Robin, and Lily come into play? Um, so they they were they were best friends since college, and they've actually ended up in those in the case of Mackenzie, Robin, and Lily. They grew up as best friends in college, and they even like moved into the same town. Um, but as they're so they they have a lot of um, secrets that they've they've been holding from each other. Um, and usually, you know, you don't tell your best friends absolutely everything, but some of these secrets were pretty big and that helped propel the, the characters to, um, I don't know, to question how much, well do we really know each other? Like, I thought you were my best friend. And meanwhile, you're, you know, you're, you're not siding with me on things, especially when it comes to, when you have friends siding with each other and against you, that's kind of what the crux of their, of their relationship is. And, um, it, it impacts the rest of the story and how each of them relates to one another. So they have, they have like teen kids. And when the teen kids cross a line in the story that sends the families into a sparring match, that's when all the ugliness starts to come out. And that's, um, that's kind of what keeps pushing the characters apart. So I'm not sure if I answered the question. Cause as I was talking, I'm like, Oh shoot, I forget what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did the characters come in and start to, to become alive to you? Like Mackenzie, Robin and Lily are these lifelong friends, but kind of what do they find themselves in? Okay. So, I always start a chapter when I think of like, when I'm writing out my story, I think what's the worst thing that could happen right now to really like in, in a real life scenario, what could happen right now? And I use that to kind of push the characters along. So I'll create a scene. And, and I think Stephen King has talked about this or um, where you always try to ask like, what would happen if I did this? And then they have to work themselves out of that situation. Or in some cases, they work themselves further into that situation. So I always just throw a curveball and say, okay, I'm going to have this happen. And then they, the characters themselves have to evolve to figure it out. And that's kind of what drives my characterization. They, I throw a weird, crazy situation in, and their reactions are going to drive their development. And there's the way they grow as characters throughout the story. And it also drives the plot because they're always trying to figure out a way to navigate whatever crazy situation I threw at them. So there's a kind of one of the, um, the, the subplots of, of this book is that there's this terrible secret. Um, what is it about secrets um, that, that are, that are so dangerous for us? And, 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 you know, we think of scenarios like this where something happens and someone has a terrible secret. Um, but what's the, what's the reality of of carrying secrets like this and, and how it affects our relationships? My grandmother once said, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And as a kid, I kind of was like, oh, grandma, you and your crazy sayings. But what it was talking about was like the stickiness of secrets. So like once you start a secret and it can be something kind of obscure, like I, I remember when um, I was little and I stole my next door neighbor's strawberry shortcake, <laughs> this little doll, because I loved the way it smelled and I, I didn't want to tell her. And 
because I had kept that secret from her and stole it, she spent like a whole year <laughs> looking for her strawberry shortcake. Oh, and I never goodness. said anything. And my secret was causing her like angst. But I was like, if I tell her now, she'll be mad. So the fallout from secrets is probably what we fear most. Or, you know, a lot of times people will, women will go on a shopping spree and not let their husband know. And meanwhile, they could be racking up debt or, um, you know, maybe doing something that could be harming their family that they're not really thinking through. And so the secrets tend to build up and they stick to us. And then it makes it harder for us to get out of whatever problems we cause. Because usually you don't keep a secret unless it's damaging, unless it right. could hurt somebody. Um, and so the more you keep holding on to these secrets, the more they build. And then you don't want to look like a liar. So you just keep piling on more lies and secrets to cover up the old ones until you're completely buried underneath it, six feet under. And there's just, I mean, the fallout is too scary to confront. So you know, you just keep doing it until it really can destroy a relationship. Cause now you've, you're untrustworthy. Nobody can trust anything you say once you start doing that. Well, an an interesting uh, plot device in, in this book is there's a murder. I think we can say that, yep. um, <laughs> but you know, more than that, more than the, the big thing that happens is each of these characters have their own little thing that they would like to keep hidden from everyone else and from the world and their and from their closest friends. And as this murder is kind of the instigator for all of this, we start to see the little things unravel that that are kind of just as just as unsettling as the big thing. Um, how fun is that to write? I I love writing about that stuff because it gives a lot of um, dynamic to each character. Like, for example, um, Mackenzie was back in college. Um, Robin did something to her that left her disfigured for life. And now Mackenzie pretended to be over it and forgive her friend, but it she had to carry the weight of this, I'll call it a secret, the secret resentment towards her best friend because as a result of her disfigurement, She's married to a man she hates, but she feels stuck because she has no self-confidence, no self-love. And so this, like writing that character, because I, it's actually loosely based on a, on a family member of mine who was disfigured, and it shaped a lot of her personality and her choices because she was always afraid, well, if I don't, if I'm not pretty enough, I'm never going to find a spouse, so I'm just going to marry the first guy who asks me. And as a result, all of her decisions were based on this, this physical, what she perceived as a physical flaw. And, but it, it, it made her made a lot, a lot of bad choices. So those types of things, like I like putting them into my characters because it drives who they are and it drives their choices. And a lot of those choices, like in Mackenzie's case, she's married to someone she hates and her friends are trying to help her getting out to get out of it. And she can't because she's like, well, what am I going to do without him? Like no one else will ever love me. And cause she couldn't love herself. So I love that aspect of really diving into the emotional experience of women. Cause there's a lot of emphasis on beauty and physical perfection and uh, that women have to carry this burden of constantly. So it's, I like exploring that aspect and how it will shape my characters, as well as the other aspects like mother being a mom, being a stay at home mom. Robin's a stay at home mom with four kids, and she knows she's completely dependent on her husband. And it, she's a little depressed because of it, because she's exhausted and, you know, out of shape and doesn't feel like herself all, all the time. And um, so all of those aspects create characters that we can say oh i totally understand that i totally feel for her um but what could make someone like so normal commit murder <laughs> <laughs> this uh this book is so fascinating to me um because like we said there's there's the big story and then there's the the little stories that um that feed into it but i, I think are just as fascinating as the big story um there's it's so much fun to to take people on on this big adventure and little ones at the same time when when you're writing 
Um, are, well, first off, you know, there's there's the big argument between writers between being a pantser and a plotter, writing by the seat of your pants or plotting out the story ahead of time. Um, how much pre-writing do you do before the novel starts? Um, oh, so I'm like a very, I'm a fence rider. I'm a fence rider on almost everything. You ask my <laughs> husband, he's like, you always share, like you always alternate your opinions on things. I'm like, I know, cause I'm always open to all kinds of things, but I tend to like, I come up with an idea and then I write a synopsis and it's usually about a page long that kind of covers, I mean, my husband and I, when we take the kids on road trips, we will spend like the entire car ride plotting out a novel. He's the best. He always helps me with this because he always comes up with crazy ideas um, that really inspire more crazy ideas from me. Um, so that's usually where I start was with my paragraph of summarizing where I want the story to go. And then I actually will go through and I will plot out each chapter because for me, I have a very short attention span. I, when I read a book, I need something to happen in every chapter. I don't know why that is. I mean, sometimes I can read and enjoy a book that's not quite so page turning, but it takes me a lot longer. So with my own writing, I like, I like some big climactic thing, and not necessarily big, but something to happen in every chapter. So I'll write that something to happen in every chapter down and I'll basically plot out the novel. Now, after I get started, I might change a million things and the whole ending will change and I'll add a twist that I wasn't thinking of when I started. But I tend to plot and then pants it after that because I'm like, oh, wait, no, I don't want it to go there anymore. Oh, no, that doesn't fit my character. I'm going to switch that whole thing around and then I might have a completely different ending. But um, so I, that's why I'm kind of in the middle of both. I don't stick to my plotting all the time. Very rarely do I stick to it. If um, when someone reads one of your uh, thrillers, when they're finished with it, Pamela, and they they close that back cover, what do you hope they're left with? Um, well, my my biggest objective is I want it. I want to keep them up all night. Like when I write, I want them to feel like they just got off an amusement park ride. Like I want them to feel a rush. I want them to um, feel like maybe question the themselves a little bit especially for some of my female characters i like when women come to me like i've gotten reviews that say like wow i you know i really related to them or even if you don't relate to them to not see broken people as broken um because like for example pretty ugly lies was based on postpartum depression that's a big theme in the book and we people with depression tend to be um I, I don't know it's like they're sick or something and and it's um and it's frowned upon and they're like oh I'll just pick up your bootstraps and you know keep going but we I want people to have a more sensitive nature to the reality of people's struggles like if we're more aware of people around us then maybe we can prevent things from happening that have maybe caused that person to be broken or we can be some a shoulder to cry on and that's basically like with my stories I, I really emphasize friendship and um being there for one another and I'm hoping like when they close the book they kind of feel like oh I'm you know maybe I need to call my mom today or maybe I should reach out to my friend today and just see how she's doing um so even if it's something little like that it kind of that's kind of where I want them to feel like, or maybe I'm not such a bad mom after all. <laughs> these moms <laughs> in these books are way worse than me, so I'm pretty okay. <laughs> that's so funny. The new book is called Little Deadly Secrets, and it's out everywhere today. We've got links to it in the show notes where you can grab it in paperback or Kindle edition or audiobook. Uh, whichever way you like to consume books, there's a link where you can find it. Uh, Pamela, this has been so much fun chatting. If people are just discovering you and want to connect with you online, where can they find you? I am on Instagram at author.pamela.crane. I'm on Facebook under author Pamela Crane. I'm at a, on website um, at pamelacrane.com. So I'm pretty, I'm on Twitter sometimes. Don't, don't message me on Twitter if I don't even really know totally how Twitter works. So, but a, a mental mommy Pam on Twitter, but that's probably not the best way to touch, touch base with me. <laughs> we'll put but links yeah, I'm online, up. So. 
great. We'll put links to uh, to all of those places where people can find you. Uh, Pamela, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at scribophile.community.